How <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah, um, the, the Q and A. Um, of course, uh, we expect most of the exchange to be face to face uh, because this is a, a small room. Uh, but if there are hot questions that you would rather ask anonymously, uh, here is a QR code you can scan. Uh, or uh, you can go to slido.com and enter 129 without a pan sign. And in either case, you get into this uh, anonymous chat room where you can ask for pretty much anything. Uh, the topic's called Ask Audrey Anything. Uh, and then uh, you can like each other these questions, so the question with the most number of likes will float to the top, but of course um, this is supplemental, so um, any questions uh, from the audience um, of course gets priority, but if there's no hands uh, raised then we will just defer to the slide of questions which tends to be uh, more direct because it's anonymous. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, thank you. And um, if, uh, the, I, I would like to start with a question myself. Okay, so we understand that uh, coming up from first of January there will be a new digital ministry that will be a full ministry. Yes, but we, we didn't say which uh, January. Okay. <laughs> The January uh, after the next. Okay. <laughs> so I want this idea in general on this speech. Sure. Right. So uh, yeah, it is true that by January uh, next year, 2021, uh, there will be a draft act, uh, the enabling act, uh, not only for the additional ministry, but actually for independent GDPR compatible um, privacy uh, protection authority as well. Um, and so uh, these are, of course, um, I think the, the only puzzle uh, piece missing from the GDPR adequacy. So we're very much looking forward to it. But it needs to be ratified by the parliament. So the parliament, we expect the parliament to maybe take uh, at most half a year to deliberate on the organizing acts. And then it will be like uh, the second half of next year, uh, which the, uh, the budget session uh, will begin. And then the agency, as well as the content authority for privacy protection, will have the budget allocated. And on the next January, <laughs> it will actually function. So that, that's the idea. So it's a legislative process. Um, any question uh, ready from the friends here? Yeah. We have only. Uh, with, with, yeah, for, for Good morning. Um, working with companies here in Taiwan, we see that cyber attacks, particularly for big industrial companies in our industrial systems, as, uh, which is kind of working with the big Taiwanese high tech companies, we think that the growing threats. Is there a government agency like in other country that can jump in to help uh, industrial companies to secure from threats? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and this is a great question. Currently, uh, we rely on the, um, the search system uh, to connect all the rapid response systems together. And the TW uh, NIC, the uh, agency, it's not really an agency, it's a group uh, to interact with the internet governance uh, system, uh, has started to deploy some cyber security and cyber defense uh, related uh, bridges uh, to the business sector. The main uh, challenge here is that if this is a uh, like a very transparent open multi-stakeholder community, as of course uh, usually internet governance forums are, then there's a limit of uh, how much information each business entity is willing to share when it faces ransomware or things like that. And so a trusted um, hub and spoke uh, configuration is probably needed uh, to make sure that the business can report, but with a additional note that says this is not for circulation or this is only for circulation if condition X is met and things like that. And so currently um, that is broadly uh, within the Department of Cybersecurity's uh, preview. Uh, but because the Department of Cybersecurity is currently uh, part of the administration proper, part of the executive unit, um, uh, we are now looking as part of this ministry reform uh, to give it more um, firepower, resource, uh, agency, uh, agency, so more agency in that agency by setting up a dedicated cybersecurity agency or uh, within the digital ministry so that's not only uh, candid, uh, 
cybersecurity agency set up their own task force, but also propose uh, their own regulations or even their own laws, uh, in which case uh, it will be much more easy for the business sector to interface with a kind of a, a zone that uh, respects this uh, trade secret or other disclosure um, um, conditions. So we're prototyping that over the course of next year. Uh, and soon as the cybersecurity security agency uh, is in full throttle, once it has the budget and so on, it will become part of the kind of official definition as part of the digital ministry cybersecurity security agency. Second question or third question. Yes, uh, I would uh, ask a question for you for asset management. Sure. Yeah, uh, because uh, particularly during the COVID 19, uh, I think uh, because uh, the, to protect uh, your employee, you must let your employee work from home. And, uh, but in Taiwan, uh, if you look at asset management industry, for example, uh, like a fund manager or a trader, uh, it should say they are. Uh, Basically, they are not allow them to work from home mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, unless you know they must have some video mm -hmm. and to make sure that so, you know during the trading hours uh, mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, observe what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. And but on the other side, uh, that will kind of like uh, you know have some privacy issue. Yeah, so so a lot of uh, mm -hmm. manager or trader, they basically they still decided mm -hmm. they want uh, you know uh, still uh, went to all base. Yeah, so for that one, because you look at the global ones, both from home policy or more mm -hmm. flexible working mm -hmm. hour is actual. I think that's uh, so important. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. my condition of entering the cabinet is that I get to work anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 but uh, yeah, from the uh, regulation mm -hmm. side, basically they have this kind of constraint. Mm -hmm. And I do understand, you know, they worry that um, probably you will have some bad behavior, you have mm -hmm. some inside trading, is that true? Uh, doing your training hour. Sure. But uh, from the government side, uh, particularly right now that we would like to have a you know, new uh, digital uh, uh, <coughs> ministries yes. uh, to be set up. Mm -hmm. And how can this department help other departments such mm -hmm. like uh, you know, SFC or FA, uh, for those uh, uh, SFC uh, to, you know, to really reduce uh, their concern mm -hmm. about the individual mm -hmm. behavior? Sure. Well, this is my office, by the way. <laughs> so, right? This is a search innovation lab. Uh, used to be an Air Force headquarters. Uh, oh. We tore down the walls, so it's now a park next to the Dan uh, Forest Park. Uh, it's just uh, across the Jingle Flower Market from the Dan Forest Park. And, and so um, this is uh, literally a park, and everybody uh, can, can just walk in and uh, witness this magical uh, because it's created by uh, people with Down syndrome with treatment differences. So people get inspired when they see this. And this is much more preferred uh, to the cabinet office. <laughs> <laughs> much more often because I get to tele telework. Um, and uh, creativity um, is evident, like when we have a visitor. Um, a mayor actually who uh, saw this public installation art in their mind, they just get so inspired that they climbed uh, on top of this uh, display. And, and right, so uh, it's not designed for, for that. So I'm really glad that it, it's resilient, didn't collapse. So that's <laughs> <laughs> mayor of Prague City, right? <laughs> and, and his small cabinet of pirates, well, not really pirates, but well, I guess they are pirate party members. So the, the point here is that um, here we have the telecommunication equipment so that when I tour around uh, Taiwan, I can just go to the most uh, rural place or remote islands and so on and facilitate the discussions that way. And because we have broadband as human rights and augmented by like real time translation, even cultural translation by indigenous uh, experts. It connects back to the search innovation lab in Taipei where people from 12 ministries can just immerse themselves uh, into the actual connected room that connects to their rural and remote places. So um, after they get kind of exposed to this kind of working, um, they uh, are much more amenable to teleworking in their own ministries afterwards because they can see 
clearly that the cybersecurity and privacy parameters is carefully designed. And teleworking doesn't mean working at home. It means uh, currently working at one of the satellite offices, which may um, resemble this kind of co-working spaces with carefully designed cybersecurity and privacy parameters. Um, and so I think this is a kind of intermediate point to get the public service um, comfortable with the idea of the essentially security enclaves that they, they can personally break in uh, closer to home, but not exactly home. Um, and then um, later on, maybe they would accept working from home uh, more easily. Um, and then once they get this experience, it's much more likely, uh, for example, for the um, uh, psychological counseling over the internet, once we get the uh, MOHW people working in this um, facility, they started to think in a more uh, out of box ways and then eventually allowed uh, startups like Far Hugs and so on to start working with uh, psychological counselors over the internet. So it is proven to work just a little bit slowly. Yeah, yeah good. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, um, but let's say so even now uh, for a dealer and even a fund manager, mm -hmm. even they work in office, mm -hmm. but they were required to hang mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to lock all their, uh, like say, iPhones mm -hmm. and their computers mm -hmm. for those personal mm -hmm. devices mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are also, you know, cannot uh, mm -hmm. have that. So let's mm -hmm. say, even though you have this kind of mm -hmm. environment, That's right. but still, you know, mm -hmm. for example, the regulator may concern like mm -hmm. uh, when they, uh, like say, get into uh, mm -hmm. uh, toilet and they mm -hmm. may, you know, mm -hmm. use their personal device mm -hmm. to press mm -hmm. order, etc. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that's part of our regulation. <laughs> I that's think right. that's that's imposed by the business. That the regulation only uh, talks about uh, cybersecurity parameter, essentially uh, making sure that the equipment that you use is an extension uh, to the official um, intranet. Basically, uh, it may mandate the use of VPNs. It may mandate the use of like uh, fixed IPs, uh, like internet protocol addresses, uh, which uh, for many people it means uh, locking to a desktop computer. But it's not necessarily the case. Actually, I think the majority of telecoms here uh, support mobile SIM cards with a fixed IP address. So uh, you can also say that this is a company issued phone with a company issued SIM card and it always connects through the same IP address and then so when you connect through the VPN it can authenticate using a, a whitelist uh, and so there's nothing preventing you from taking uh, like this iPod and claiming that this is uh, just really you and also it's company issued and things like that. Uh, so nothing in the regulation for this stuff. Actually we, we do use it ourselves so we, we ought to know uh, but uh, it uh, does take at one time and, you know, to to just challenge the norm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, of course. Face to face um, has priority, so Hi, <coughs> I'm Stephanie Hi. from the Hi. British Office. Hi. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think the top priority should be for uh -huh. the new digital ministry uh -huh. and what policy interventions should be made to ensure that Taiwan can really benefit from the digitization mm -hmm. of the global economy that has mm -hmm. happened so rapidly this year. Sure, there's a slide for that. Um, just a second, right. So, <coughs> sorry, this is in, in Mandarin, but basically the priorities uh, are innovation, inclusion and sustainability. So, um, in or in more expanded terms, um, the, the innovations that um, take the technology for it to work uh, with the society rather than asking the society to adapt to disruptive technologies. So, disruptive technologies don't disrupt the society. That's what the first one is saying. The second one is saying that for new immigrants uh, and also for new residents and so on, uh, we need to move towards becoming a transcultural uh, republic of citizens, uh, which is my translation for the official name of the country, by the way. Uh, and so that is uh, transcultural republic citizens. That's the, the second pillar. And the third one uh, is about circular uh, economy, uh, zero waste and things like that. And so uh, like this jacket is literally made uh, from upcycled material like 12 plastic bottles and five coffee bean waste and things like that. And, and so uh, this is something digital can really help because the digital technologies enable uh, management of the assets uh, in the materials and in the carbon footprint and things like that without 
which it's actually not possible to track all the externalities that each uh, action is having on climate change or, or things like that. So, um, so if, if you, um, so here is um, like connected urban forest, collective climate action, participatory energy making, and things like that. There's a lot of uh, pretty complex blueprints, <laughs> uh, but uh, the whole idea is that the digital environment need to empower uh, human agency so that we can interact better with the civic assets and also uh, for the civic assets, for example, the Internet of the Forest and things like that, to feedback through simulations uh, so that we can uh, deliver insights of all the externalities of our collective actions. And so that is uh, one part of the, the sustainability part. I can talk for hours, this is a seminar topic, but this is a, a simple answer. I'm being so old-fashioned to raise my hand, and that is the uh, so uh, What are some of the efforts that are being made to encourage uh, women entrepreneurs, especially women in tech? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So we have a gender impact uh, assessment, uh, and it's been going on for, I think, 14 years now. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good system. So um, I, I'm going to talk in very broad brushes, uh, but you can check it out uh, from the Gender Equality Committee's uh, point of view. So um, of course, um, well, this is the, the tweet, but uh, also the parliamentarians, over 40% of which women now, um, all of this uh, is tracked, including the Miss Me uh, owner and so on, uh, by the gender uh, dashboard, or Zhongyao uh, Xingbie Zhongyao, so, so this is a dashboard that just keeps accumulating from all the uh, bills and all the um, major uh, budget items within the government. So anything that lasts one year or more need to file this uh, gender impact assessment to form a theory of change to be reviewed by the Gender Equality Committee that has one more vote from civil society organization leaders than ministers. Uh, and so this is a, a quite conscious decision. So after a project or a bill expires, still it its uh, tracking and its um, influence uh, will continue on on um, this gender dashboard. So I, I'm going to skip the details because this is literally what um, all of us have to file whenever we come up with a um, project. We have to do statistics analysis, policy analysis, and things like that. So after uh, many years of evaluation, we would link our main work with gender and proactively discover gender-related issues. So um, in my recent conversation in, in APAC, uh, with the title Open Response, Re Open Recovery, uh, which is um, also Interestingly, um, I'm representing myself with a domain name instead of a country name. But in any case, the point is that uh, we uh, take a look at gender um, impact dashboard and then uh, started to design our financial assistance for the open recovery phase after the COVID and uh, make sure that the e-learning capacity building for women is prioritized uh, based on that. And that also uh, fits into, for example, our triple stimulus voucher um, policy to encourage um, the revenue of retail and catering uh, segments. And we basically mandated that everyone who would want to enjoy from the TSV need to go out and buy uh, from Miss Me uh, instead of just stay at home and order from the e-commerce platforms or the food delivery platforms and so on. Uh, and so that has really um, made a really good dent uh, in the gender impact dashboard when it concerns Miss Me uh, as well. So the details of which can be gleaned from the Miss Me uh, agency. But uh, the theory is that we just look at a gender statistic impact dashboard and uh, do our theory of change based on what we know uh, will encourage more women entrepreneurs and also people who want more flexible uh, working environments, this to go hand in hand. Uh, Minister, you were uh, earlier during the breakfast here sharing the copies of the new digital oh, yeah, yes. that are coming yes. out, mm -hmm. and uh, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, it's very nice to see that uh, great lengths have gone into protecting mm -hmm. the personal data, so yes. it won't be visible mm -hmm. uh, on the face of the card. Mm -hmm. My question is: Will the same considerations also be made for the permanent residents and the residence mm -hmm. certificate for foreign nationals mm -hmm. when when this new rollout comes mm -hmm. and takes place next year? Yeah, this is a great question. 
Um, it is true that our citizen digital certificates has more update uptake than uh, the a alien well citizen <laughs> alien uh, digital certificates, uh, which many uh, people didn't even know that exists, right? But it's, it's something for electronic signatures, uh, but for uh, non citizens. And so there's a concerted effort, and also thanks to many of you here, uh, to get the ID format of those two strands um, unified. So that uh, I think it's also uh, January, and, and by that I mean next January, <laughs> like recent <laughs> now, <laughs> that any of you can, can voluntarily um, uh, switch to a new national ID looking um, numbering system. And the first year is free, actually. After what you have to you know, pay, pay for the transactional <laughs> necessary costs. Uh, and so once the, the, the format of the uh, ARC as well as the national ID is um, um, unified and all the e-commerce sites and all the uh, businesses have adapted to this new format. This will make it much more easy uh, for the uh, IC card to basically work for both uh, and, um, and and all sorts of discrimination online, right? So, um, and, and this uh, ID card, uh, as I showed here, um, there's an important part in the regulation that says this um, IC card is actually optional, the IC part is optional. So uh, anyone uh, can see that um, this has less information on the face of the card uh, than the current generation, the sixth generation ID card. And on the back, um, it only says whether you are single or married, but it doesn't reveal your spouse's name or your parents' name or your residential address or things like that. So all in all, it's more privacy per uh, But for people who said that they don't want it to be as in card, they can use stickers uh, to just you know, uh, hide the passport-like uh, pin code. It's not really a pin code, it's a reading code. Um, and the serial number and the IC card. And once you shield this using stickers, the I, I, this stickers, by the way, are officially from the MOI. I just received it um, yesterday. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so the MOI said publicly yesterday that if you put on all those stickers, nobody can force you to remove it. And that's indeed true. It's according to the regulation. Uh, all the service providers need to keep uh, this purely analog uh, service way pathway and no one can force you to uh, engage in the electronic uh, pathway. Uh, so the front of the card is the primary one and the back of the card is essentially opt-in and you can opt out uh, using sticker. So we'll test that for the next uh, six months or so in Xinju City. Uh, and if, if people in Xinju City like it, uh, then we'll probably uh, also extend it uh, to other um, certificates, including the ARC and so on. But if the people in Xinju City requires change, uh, for example, if they claim for the <coughs> spouse's name to be displayed for some reason, <laughs> then the, the format may, may still change. So we we'll know by maybe next July or so. Yeah. Okay, if I may just a quick follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned the new format that is mm -hmm. coming into, into effect for the ARC numbers. Mm -hmm. This is something that we've been advocating for for over 10 years actually, so we're very happy to see it actually happen. Uh, it won't be identical with the Taiwan system as the, as the first digit will be an eight or a nine. So my question is, will it actually work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the first uh, digit, yes, that's right. So uh, it will, of course, work uh, if the people who are in charge of the e-commerce systems actually change um, their uh, checksum, right, their, their code. Uh, if they do not change their code, uh, there is a point of contact in the MOEA who will um, strongly encourage uh, them to, to change the code. I was just um, answering that this very question on Foramosa uh, yesterday um, during the um, uh, parliamentary interpolation, actually. Uh, so I, I was just, um, you know, while the interpolation is going on, I was just answering uh, posts on Foramosa. Uh, and basically, uh, we have a Consumer Protection Act that ensures the equity and equality uh, of all the consumers. So um, I heard from the Foramosa contributors that they are now crowdsourcing uh, a list of uh, e-commerce providers uh, that currently make the um, mistake of not admitting uh, ARC uh, members. And they will uh, basically send uh, emails, I guess, um, initially polite and increasingly angry emails to them, <laughs> demanding that they, they conform uh, to the new uh, formats, I think, next January. And so um, I already promised on Formosa that I will uh, help however I can, like, um, like physically 
visiting those e-commerce vendors if necessary. Uh, and so I, I'm all for making this a real change. Uh, and within, uh, again, I think this the, the first six months, just like the uh, EID test phase, uh, will let us uh, wrinkle out uh, all the um, problems in the initial in, in the, um, implementation. So yeah, if there's anything within the uh, next six months or so that prevents this new formats from, from working on the technological level, then I'm happy to, to serve even as you know a coder to personally fix those uh, regular expressions. Yeah. <coughs> yes, two questions. Yeah, I, I have a follow-up question to what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, no, by the way, a long time to see. <laughs> we, uh, we have, uh, yeah, as a software developer or someone who knows about software libraries, we always have the problem <coughs> actually to find reference libraries from the government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how to, how, I don't even know the specification of the new EID, I mm -hmm. just see from the news that mm -hmm. the ID number might be 8 or 9, but I don't see mm -hmm. any, <coughs> any mm -hmm. government page or reference implementation like for mm -hmm. some, which software yeah, it, is It's in schema.gov.tw, we'll get it updated. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be shared more with the software developers mm -hmm. because most of the software developers I know they they just search on Google or on the mm -hmm. Stack Exchange, right? So they will they will find the information mm -hmm. there. Yeah, so we can work on our SEO, that's for sure. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so that we show up on the first page. So I think the government <laughs> has to provide an SDK mm -hmm. to, to developers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we will, of course, provide a schema and the schema, uh, because we have open API standard as part of our standard procurement um, rules, right? So, uh, so just as a background, in Taiwan for many years, if you uh, go to a website, you may see uh, three um, like colon, 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 right? <coughs> three punctuation marks on the top of the page. And that's the accessibility indicator, I mean, that this is designed for people who uh, have seen difficulties and for all our our IT contractors and system integrators, if they say, I have to charge you extra to make my website accessible for you, uh, then uh, actually they get disqualified for being a professional because a professional vendor needs to take care of people with wine. And so uh, four years ago, when I first became digital minister, uh, I got this uh, amendment that says also that you have to uh, provide an interface for robots essentially through an open API <coughs> that conforms to the schema uh, including the registration uh, of the national ID system and so um, if a vendor um, says that this website this uh, service that I designed for the government um, can only work with humans but not robots they could also get disqualified from discriminating against robots but we don't quite say that in the regulation but it's the effect uh, and so I think at least for the government run services, uh, the upgrade uh, will be smooth. But uh, we can't promise the same for the e-commerce uh, vendors, which uh, technically isn't a you know licensed operation. So we have very little leverage over them. Uh, so it relies on the Consumer Protection Act as well as the crowdsourced um, campaign. And but I'm happy to also support that campaign. Good morning, Andrea. I had a question around um, digital skills and talent uh, mm -hmm. broadly, uh, which most companies across most industries and, and geographies are seeking. Uh, what's your thoughts on building these skills versus you know buying them through an on-demand workforce? And is there mm -hmm. much of that that exists uh, in terms of buying these skills in Taiwan? Okay. Um, so uh, just to clarify a, a little bit, uh, making sure that I heard you correctly, when we refer to digital skills, what, what specifically have you in, in mind? I think broadly, I think most companies are going through some form of digital transformation. Mm -hmm. So I speak more for kind of multinational companies that mm -hmm. are seeking these skills mm -hmm. uh, internally and, and mm -hmm. struggling with perhaps finding them in the market mm -hmm. or building them. Okay, yeah, so uh, we, we do have um, a plan for that, and uh, it's called uh, 3t.org.tw. It's a pilot, it may expand more uh, in the future, and some of you may have seen that uh, there was a short film promoting it where I played the role of Doraemon, and uh, anyway, uh, <coughs> and so uh, this is targeting, uh, yeah, here's uh, something that tells you just to, to sign up, right? <laughs> <laughs> that says <laughs> that, that there's uh, no, no tuition uh, needed uh, for the talents freshly out of college um, to uh, go to the digital transformation ambassador uh, training position for the service industry, for the marketing and communication, for the uh, manufacturing, as well as for just developing AI. And uh, this is targeting not only college students who major in uh, ICT, 
but also pretty much everyone, because we see that digital tra transformation um, comes first from the idea that if you get five really young people together as a team, they can transform the norm, the, the culture of a existing team. So that, for example, teleworking, uh, for example, um, the idea of automating away some of the chores uh, that was taken for granted and so on, uh, basically uh, take a uh, foothold in that particular six uh, months. Um, it's like an internship, but we call it uh, ambassadorship, so that they can uh, have a real case of uh, digitally transforming one NISME uh, in their nearby vicinity, after which they will be more qualified to join the kind of multinationals uh, that you mentioned, because they already have some success or failure, but very public failure that they learn from uh, and under um, their uh, portfolio. And so, yeah, we're, we're happy that we get um, many um, leaders from the business communities to essentially coach uh, like five uh, young students at a time on um, digital transformation projects six uh, months at a time. So yeah, if you're interested uh, in, in that, uh, please uh, visit 3t.org, TW, and broadly it's modeled after our own internship program uh, in my office, which we uh, have, uh, I think, 30 uh, interns, uh, usually college uh, level, um, or um, the, the master's degrees level. Uh, but anyway, uh, so 30 people every year for four years, so that's 120 people. Uh, and uh, all they do is just to look at the digital service um, from the government that they don't like and make it better. <laughs> so they, they would improve, for example, this Ministry of Labor, this is the Taipei uh, City Hospital, uh, this is the Taipei um, Citizen Service, this is the Youth Development Agency, Qilong um, uh, City, and uh, Taiwan Jobs, uh, and the um, uh, uh, Bureau of uh, Social Work in the Taichung City, and, and many things like that. And all of them have also shared uh, how they have developed their skills for digital transformation by interning um, in my office and working with um, the, the actual uh, agencies. But uh, what we have learned from this is that it takes literally four years to gain the trust uh, for the career public service uh, for them to do this truly transformational work. The first year, uh, they were all literally just fixing the website so it works on non-internet explorer browsers, uh, which is really kind of trivial, but it's also important work uh, to get the trust built. And then the second year on mobile services, on, and only on the third and the fourth year do they get to pick the the kind of digital service they want to transform, so it also takes time. Yes. Uh, nice to meet you. I, I'm Toshiaki Kimura from Jera. Uh, Jera is a Japanese power utility, and uh, now uh, in Taiwan, now we are developing uh, offshore wind, uh, Hormosa 1, 2, and 3. Uh, now uh, we are considering to use uh, AI for operation of the power plant. Uh, but uh, I want to ask your advice. Uh, in, if we consider to use uh, AI, uh, what human still can do? Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, I think uh, recently AI system mm -hmm. is very um, improved. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of operation, maybe AI can do mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm wondering what is uh, still the role of the human? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm not sure it's a good question. It is a great question. <laughs> it's a question of our time. Yeah, so, um, and, and I really think it's, a, it's an awesome question. So, um, back to, to this. So, um, interestingly, um, when, when I see the term AI, uh, I think of uh, assistive intelligence. So um, assistive intelligence is just the latest in development in a long line of assistive technology. For example, this is assistive technology, the, the eyeglass, because it helps me see better. And it's aligned to, to my best interest, uh, that is to say, to see better. Um, instead of other people's interests, for example, I don't see pop-up advertisement on my eyeglass. <laughs> that would be somebody else's uh, interest. Um, and then uh, my grandma, for example, has a hearing aid uh, that helps her to, to hear better. Again, it needs to be aligned to her and be accountable uh, when it doesn't work uh, or when it breaks, instead of uh, you know just randomly serving advertisements or podcasts uh, to her. Right? 
<laughs> so, uh, so we, we already have a social norm around assistive technology in that it needs to respect the dignity of the individual uh, interacting with the technology and augment uh, the individual so that it works better uh, with the society and so on. So if we develop AI as assistive uh, intelligence, uh, I don't think there, there will be that much a worry of being replaced. I wouldn't worry about me being replaced by my eyeglasses. My grandma wouldn't be replaced by her hearing aid uh, because these are assistive in, in nature. But on the other hand, there are um, you know, jurisdictions that see AI more as authoritarian uh, intelligence than to say a vehicle for, for control. Um, but uh, I think it's a misnomer to say you know, AI will enslave people. People enslave people through AI, right? So, so AI doesn't have this um, motivation to, to enslave anyone. This is just a way to say that if you over concentrate um, the power to make decisions to a uh, limited uh, number of people, then it makes it authoritarian in nature. So authoritarian intelligence, assistive intelligence, two very different uh, development methodologies. And so the main difference is really the, the feedback loop. If the um, individuals within a uh, what we call a ACI, uh, assisted collective intelligence system, all have the capability of uh, feeding back to the um, AI system to demand accountability when the alignment uh, is uh, maybe questioned and so on, then we are in a good feedback loop and so people can collectively benefit from it. But if we cut the feedback loop, for example, if we only have the uh, Central Epidemic Command Center daily live press, press conference, but without the chance for journalists asking questions or for citizens calling in the hotline 1922, uh, then it would be seen as very authoritarian. But because of the feedback loop and the real rapid response, then everybody who has a stake in it, who maybe gets uh, harmed by the AI development, uh, can correct its course very quickly. So the assistive part, I think, is the most important guiding us. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. More questions. I would like to have a follow following question on yeah. all the digital talent. Sure. Because we are uh, trying to introduce some uh, digital tools about having healthcare from the, uh, other country or from our global practice. But it seems that it's not easy to convince or communicate with the government about the change of the regulation or the practice. So uh and as I know, you, you already uh, introduced and built some open community, try to change their mindset <coughs> instead of uh, instead of top down, they change their mindset from bottom up. They mm -hmm. try to open mind to listen to different in, opinion from, in, from communities. So uh, Matt, I know you were a suggest, suggestion. Uh, how, uh, as a, a global healthcare uh, digital medical device company, uh, uh, what's the strategy to approach the government <coughs> to uh, try to change the mind of the new regulatory um, healthcare industry? Or mm -hmm. should we try to look right from the top mm -hmm. down and also from the communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, it, the reason why I emphasize the, the public art installation and this a very um, like friendly atmosphere uh, for the responsive, inclusive, and representative decision making is because you, you can't really change their mind, but you can't change their feelings. You, you can change the, the effect, right? What they feel uh, about any particular technology. So if the first exposure for a, for example, uh, public service ministry of transportation and communications uh, to the self-driving vehicles uh, is this huge truck that moves very fast and occasionally, you know, causes accidents, they're bound to be very conservative uh, in their response to self-driving technology. But because in our uh, social innovation lab, uh, their first exposure is actually to those tricycles that are just this high end, isn't faster than me running. Uh, so uh, they will see this as something that is um, has the potential to co-create, uh, to basically serve as like shopping carts or something for the people in Jim Bolsar market and also for the nearby uh, like tech, the tech students, the open community you mentioned to, to pack it, to, to change it so it's more pro-social and would learn to, for example, respect the elderly, yield to the elderly, which the original designers in Boston didn't really care. They, they only care about yielding to children. So anyway, so the point is that different society have 
different social norms, and so for the public service to see the first demonstration of your technology as respecting the norm, um, massively increase the trust between them and you. And then they also, of course, we worry about two things. Uh, the first is the political risk. Will this, um, you know, expose me to political risk? And the second is that will this, um, you know, uh, make me spend more time uh, on my work than I'm already spending over time on my work? Or will uh, this new technology actually manage my time better so that the regulatory technology can take away some of the burdens uh, that the individual needs to, to take on a daily basis? So to um, increase the trust, to reduce the risk, to save your time, you, you can't probably do all three in one emerging technology, but at least we can demonstrate first we do no harm. That is to say we don't trust uh, you know, the technology to, um, um, for example, make all the human decisions uh, by the AIs. That was the, the previous question. Uh, but if it's an assistive role, like a GPS navigator or something that provides the contextual information uh, for the human beings, then that's more trustworthy. So it gains a little bit on the trust part while not sacrificing anything on the risk part or on the um, part that uh, the time consuming part and so uh, this is uh, what we call a Pareto improvement an improvement on one axis without sacrificing the other axis and so if we, you keep doing Pareto improvements then eventually the public service will come around and say oh yeah this looks like very much uh, privacy preserving for uh, things like uh, the latest developments in medical um, use of computation. There's things like the what we call the fully homomorphic encryption, uh, which will uh, make the public cloud providers capable of calculating running computations on um, very sensitive and private data, but running it on encrypted form. Uh, and then it can compute any encrypted input into encrypted output without looking into any of the data there. And so when it delivers the results, then uh, we can just decrypt and receive it from it. Uh, but this is a literal a, a like uh, as of this year uh, new mathematical breakthrough and so uh, the existing regulations of course did not anticipate it so what's important here is that we demonstrate for just one very simple formula maybe calculating the average uh, that this works as intended without exposing people to risk, without uh, consuming their time, and the trust will increase a little bit. So this is the kind of theory of change that I'm operating with. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Uri. My name is Peter Sutton. I mm -hmm. work with Woodpecker mm -hmm. Learning. We're a language immersion software company and we do our development here in Taiwan. I want to ask you about the Bilingual Nation project. So mm -hmm. I think initially it was mainly with the Ministry of Education, but I saw recently the Examination Unit has come out with mm -hmm. exams courses for civil service. Mm -hmm. I wonder what, what um, you know, remote learning or language learning software opportunities mm -hmm. that you're seeing uh, in your role. And, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people using Duolingo uh, as part of the, even on the kindergarten level, <laughs> actually. Uh, and the, re uh, the, the regulatory reform that basically uh, takes the existing kindergarten regulations and relax them. So the kindergartens are now, uh, well, very soon will be, uh, allowed to basically uh, teach bilingually. Uh, so not as a foreign language, but as a second language, or even as one of the primary languages, uh, those will be legal. And uh, there's a lot of the demands of the new um, teaching methodologies uh, to, to work with kinder kindergarten level. So I would suggest start there, because if you start there, then it's, it's more natural. Uh, and for uh, many parents, the kindergarten is there for, for playing anyway. There's uh, less uh, pressure for, for example, individual to individual competition or things like that. And so like gaming uh, software, <laughs> It's always a, a much more um, um, experimental field uh, than educational software, which we need to you know conform to these ideals about education, uh, and so just make it more about play uh, than learning. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. There is time for one last question, if mm -hmm. uh, any. Yeah. And, and I want to, 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 to not completely <laughs> ignore Slido, so after this I'll take some Slido sure, questions. Sure, sure. But I think it's a very important question. Uh -huh. um, also, uh, of course I want to go back to data privacy and AI. Uh -huh. you know, sure. They're very well connected, right? So uh -huh. uh, I'm not talking about the self-driving cars, I'm not talking about the industrial machine learning and so on, but I'm very concerned about the 
uh, private data being used en masse, you know, a lot of data, your mm -hmm. big data, mm -hmm. uh, being used by companies in mm -hmm. Taiwan, like AI labs, you know, who mm -hmm. say like, okay, mm -hmm. I will care a little bit about privacy, mm -hmm. but give us all the data of all the citizen, mm -hmm. all the, you know, uh, X-ray data, every data mm -hmm. which is available. Mm -hmm. uh, for myself, when I was getting the mask for the mm -hmm. first time in Taiwan, was the mask distribution system, mm -hmm. which is quite secure because you have to do a device binding, right, and you have to, but then it's just a password to see the NHI app. And I was very shocked when I went to the NHI app, I went to my own dirt data and I could see that I can see how much contributions I gave to the NHI every month since 13 years. So I could see how much money I was paying in the NHI since 13 years. So, so my question to that is, uh, because it will not be possible in Europe, because any privacy impact assessment would tell the government, no, we don't need to keep the data for 13 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, my question is, what is your roadmap in mm -hmm. terms to reach uh, adequacy with the GDPR? Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is your, you think mm -hmm. it can be done within two years, <coughs> three years, mm -hmm. or? Because there's a lot of things to cover, right? Mm -hmm. But the GDPR doesn't actually disallow, you know, keeping a record for 13 years or 14 years if there is a legitimate historical interest or scientific interest in that. Um, so, I mean, it's up for each uh, member countries to determine the norm, right? Uh, but uh, I'm not defending this uh, data retention rule, but I'm just pointing out that without the My Data portal at MIT, HINET, TGOV, TW, people doesn't even know how much data that the government has uh, on, on them. Uh, and so, having a single download like a uh, blue button um, here is really the first step because without which uh, people cannot uh, form a reasonable expectation of uh, new norms around data retention and privacy and things like so, that. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of things like subject data access mm -hmm. requests. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. I, I, I yeah. And, and that's the that's the my data. So that's the my data. So you're going to implement all these things. And yes, we we have implemented this. Uh, on the regulatory level and on the algorithmic level. Uh, the main thing that we do not currently conform to the GDPR is that there is no enforcement agency that is independent. Currently, the regulatory interpretation agency is part of the NDC. So the appointment and the budget is part of the NDC budget. Uh, and uh, even the uh, GDPR negotiation office within the NDC isn't really an enforcement agency for all the different competent authorities because the competent authorities by law, the, our data privacy law, uh, is actually their own um, um, their own DPA, uh, but we don't get you know twelve more seats uh, by the virtue of having twelve DPAs. <laughs> so uh, as for roadmap, that that's the first thing that needs to change, and that's what I refer to in next January. We'll send this independent DPA that has enforcement capabilities uh, to the legislature, and once they legislate it and uh, give it the budget the later half of the next year, then we can fully conform to the GDPR because then the out of norm behaviors could be enforced by the independent. DPA who do not need to worry uh, that the head of the uh, association or the council will be replaced by higher ops because in a sense there is no higher ops uh, that the higher up is a premier. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I hope it, I hope it can be your ministry that will do that job. Thank you. Thank uh, you. The screen is off. It's uh, saying that time is up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, it has a it has a, a timer. Yes. yes. So so maybe I'll just take two minutes uh, to to quickly uh, answer the the slide of questions. Um, so the first one talks about uh, the DCA uh, draft. Uh, and then the DCA draft is currently uh, under uh, another round of review. The main uh, contention of the DCA draft was that there was no competent authority of the DCA. Uh, there was no digital competent authority. The NCC says we help drafting the law, but we are not the competent authority, which is kind of an anomaly. Uh, and so I think with the digital ministry, it's far more likely that the DCA uh, will get approval from the legislative uh, floor because finally it will have a competent authority that is in charge of not only interpreting but also enforcing uh, the, the DCA clauses. Um, so um, the, the protection of internet infrastructure, the core of internet infrastructure. For the past uh, six years now, uh, we basically have a procurement rule that says anything related to security, not just cybersecurity, uh, we disallow uh, PRC, that's People's Republic of China regime uh, components. Uh, and so um, we already have this clean path thing before it was you know, called clean path. <laughs> and so we're, we're happy to help uh, on that particular regard. Um, would you like to buy an autonomous car? Uh, I'll probably rent one, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that, that's the whole point, right? Because it will come to you. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that's that's actually my answer. It, it's much more uh, designed as part of the urban infrastructure than a traditional ownership model. Um, the impact on privacy and disclose to the public, definitely. Uh, we, we did actually do uh, privacy impact assessment at the request of the parliament uh, from the hearing uh, earlier on, a few months ago, the Department of Service Security, uh, the Ministry of uh, Justice uh, all gave their reports and assessments, uh, particularly to the digital fence uh, program. But of course, after COVID, just like after SARS 1.0, we'll probably do a much more comprehensive review and see how we can um, improve for the better for the next SARS hopefully not anytime soon. Um, and finally, the regular fistfights in the Taiwanese parliament is that just to create a buzz <coughs> in foreign <coughs> social media. No, it's meant for domestic social media as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, uh,